Uh, before we go on, I would like to just give a big shout out to our team. Um, this is a group of people who, oh, we spend a lot, a lot, a lot of hours uh, putting these kinds of programs together and it's, uh, it's a labor of love and it's, uh, it's so fulfilling for me personally and I know for each one of us that is, uh, is doing it. We do this because we care and we really want to um, be a vehicle for something to happen in our community, something positive to happen in our community. So I'd just like to thank Tanya Dutton for our presentation, Nancy Keller, and I know that Mark is here, Mark Taylor, did he? Okay, so Mark Taylor, Taylor is our other, our other member and he's been so instrumental um, uh, putting all of this together. So thank you so much you guys for all that you are and all that you do. And Brock. Okay, we have another video clip for you. Let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are. Teachers, coaches, firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Now let's line them up according to their wealth. Poorest people on the left, wealthiest on the right, just a steady row of folks based on their net worth. We'll color code them like we did before based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now, let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism, all the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream and keep our country moving forward. So. Here's that ideal we asked everyone about. Something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. 9 out of 10 people, 92%, said this was a nice, ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. This is what people think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30% are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly a hundred times that of the poorest Americans and about ten times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change. And the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10 percent are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top 2 to 5 percent are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1 percent? This guy? Well, his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. This is the top 1% we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own because he won't fit on my chart. 1% of America has 40% of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80%, 8 out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, only has 7% between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years.
and the have-nots. The line. The place that people on the bottom are trying to get to and the place that people on the top are trying to keep from going below. They don't want to look below it either. <laughs> they don't want to see what's down there because that'll make them feel too guilty about being above it. The line is the firing line in which people face survival or death. And sometimes the person holding the gun is their neighbor, and sometimes it's their congressman or their alderman who's not doing enough to help them. The line is where you are always in a position to give, to give help. And then for the first time, this line of, I've gone from being somebody who could help to being somebody who needs help. There's a certain amount of pride that comes in being independent. And there's a certain amount of shame that comes into having to beg for every little thing that you get. $23,000 is no money, nearly. And yet I could still see families who make 35,000, who are still poor, who are still about to lose their home, who still can't afford groceries. When you start trying to tell people about poverty, they start making excuses and, and making heartless statements about why people are in poverty and they don't even have a clue. They don't even have a clue. Some of the most prevalent and damaging stereotypes about poor people are that they're lazy, that they're stupid, they don't have any skills, prefer poverty, that they can't take care of their families. Poor people are working harder, just trying to keep their heads above water than we, than we can even imagine. It's just, it's, it's hard. It doesn't matter if you have to stand in line and kind of feel bad about yourself, that you're a failure, you have to cross that line to be able to keep the lights on, to be able to keep feeding your kids. That could be you without a house, wondering if they're gonna go and put you out. But for the grace of God, because a lot of these people had jobs, have degrees, did everything right but the bottom fell out. And that bottom was that line. They went below that line. Some things to think about. It's easy, as I said earlier, it's easy to identify that poor person, that homeless person who's laying drunk or passed out in, in the street in the park, and we have a certain kind of story about them and what that, mean, that means and, and what our response is to that. But there is a lot of hidden poverty in our, in our city, right here in Santa Barbara, Goleta. There are people who are living in their cars. There are people that can hardly make it. There are people who are working and living in their cars. There are people who are standing in line at the supermarket with their food stamp card or whatever that is now, <coughs> who we think all kinds of things about what that all means, but they're just trying to get by. So part of the conversation here is about people's stories, and part of it is going to be what can we do as a community to kind of help things along? So at this point, I'd like the panelists to come back up. And I'm going to invite the audience here to share a comment or ask a question of the panelists. Um, and again, we're going, to, uh, we're, we're going to keep it to about three minutes. Uh, for comments and for responses. And uh, we also want to focus on the positive. This is not a time for us to go negative. We already get that. We can get, you can go home and get all the negativity you want to on the internet. That's not what tonight is about. 
So, um, are there questions, comments out there that you guys might have? <coughs> we have, uh, Bill is going to be uh, running the microphone. I just wanted to mention that had a program about a month ago about these men out in, the builders out in San Bernardino that are building homes that are off the grid. And they're right across the street from a tract development, which is not selling because it's too expensive. And these homes cost about a quarter of what it would cost to build a tract home. Plus, they're totally off the grid. And this might be something that we might be thinking about here, that we could do this. I mean, they're doing it in tiles, above tiles. They've got homes off the grid. And Arco Santo, Arco Santo, if any of you've been there in Arizona, it's really interesting to see these places. And they, they are much less expensive than the way we build houses regularly. So. Just a thought. Can you, uh, can you just clarify what you mean by off the grid? Well, I mean they have solar. The one, I went to houses in above Taos, about an hour above Taos, and these are regular looking homes. They're not the adobe looking round things. They're regular homes. You know, they have a cistern in the roof that comes down into the, I mean, it's a funnel in the roof that comes down into a cistern in the house. The water is used five times. I don't know that size. Are they affordable? They are affordable. They have solar, so they're not using any electricity. They're using um, the solars for you know heat too, and the, the whole south side of the house is all glass, so that the sun can come in and heat up the house. Uh, they grow vegetables inside. This is out in the middle of the desert. Um, it is fascinating. It really is. In fact, I have a pamphlet at home. I should bring it and, and leave it at church sometimes so you can look at it. But because it's totally off the grid, and you, you buy you buy a lot, and you build a house, and that's the way it is. It's really great. Thank you. And you don't have any utility bills. No. I don't even know what we could talk about, but I'm going to say what I want to talk about. <laughs> My name is John Derrick, and thank you, Lois. Um, I was deported illegally when I was a kid from the country and my dad had, and my mom had drug uh, psychotropic problems and my dad alcohol and ended up in foster homes and I ran away to come in the U.S. Anyway, it's a very complex story and your office has helped me get my U.S. citizenship so I'm very grateful for that. Uh, and I was born a U.S. citizen, I just didn't have the paperwork and you should have seen the battles at the border. And I persisted, so I'm uh, grateful you helped. So along the way, I invented a shower for people that live in their cars. And if there's people that can help me, I, I want to achieve this very badly. And I put a tremendous amount of efforts in my invention. So what I, what I did is that um, as I was fighting for my U.S. citizenship, I had to live in my car. And so... I invented a shower that you hitch on the hitch, and it's a five glass box when you're traveling. And when you stop somewhere, you press on a button, and it goes up to six foot high. It's fully enclosed, and you go inside, and you take a hot shower anywhere you want, with any vehicle, at any time. Do you know so, about the showers, the blessings? Yes. Th that's different. That's, okay. a, that's a trailer. This shower, is a, it follows your vehicle anywhere you want, at any time. So if you, if you live in your car and you find a job, you have dignity because once you have your shower, you have everything. It's like you could go out without food for 10 days, but try going out without a shower without, for 10 days. It's absolutely despicable. So, so once you get your shower, you feel refreshed, you feel enthusiastic, you feel happy, and then you can go out and work and, and achieve your dreams, you know? Like fight for your your citizenship, like I did. Absolutely, I have a provisional patent right now. And so, if there's anybody, if you guys can help, I, I've got. I, I've got, It's got to come up. It's got. We can't let people live homeless without a shower. We cannot live this way. This government spent seven hundred billion. They voted for that to go to war, and they leave the people homeless. It's absolutely, absolutely disgusting. So that's my message and. Thank you for this. Why does the 1% have so much more money than the rest of us? Anybody know? That's a great question. 
I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna give that to you. <laughs> I think that's a great question. I want, I want to ask your comment. The tax bill. <laughs> first time they they're bragging about it now that it, it has passed through the House. It's sitting in the Senate, and it's going to make that disparity even worse. I think. Yeah. So, um, well, I just following along with some of your comments. Where does the lo lobbying, where is the influence in places where these kind of laws are written? It doesn't come from people down there scraping by to survive through the day. Maybe somebody else has a comment. I think, I, you know, just to take a, a stab at it, we have, a, we have allowed this to happen. Um, through, I think we haven't been paying attention. This, the one percent. This hasn't. This isn't just brand new stuff. This has been going on for many, 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 many years. It's just gotten the it, the gap has gotten wider and wider and wider. And some of the people, the, those one percent people, are making obscene amounts of money. And it has to do with the fact that profits are more important than people. Um, instead of paying decent wage, they will not pay a decent wage and, and, and because they have to show a profit for their shareholders. Instead of, um, instead of making improvements in infrastructures, um, you know, all, whatever that might be, instead of doing that, no, they will defer all of that so they can show profit, 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 profit. Meanwhile, everything, in the infrastructure is beginning to crumble. So we've watched this happening. It's not. It's nothing new. Uh, as kind of ugly sometimes as the rhetoric gets around people being fed up, there's a real important basis there for why people are angry. You know, it's like you want to say, "Well, the wool's been pulled over my eyes." No, the wool has not been pulled over. You just have. You just haven't been paying attention. And now all of a sudden we are. So I think we're, we are at a crossroads of making some very important decisions about what's important in this culture and in this society and this country. And I think as, again, as, as much as um, it, it's creating so much discomfort, how does that go? You know, it's kind of like birthing a baby. You know, when you, it, there's a lot of contractions and pain and, and, and thrust into you know discomfort when you're when you're birthing something new. So I have I my hope is that that's where we're at. We're just in a one big contraction. <laughs> and then one other example of right along this area. I don't know if, how many of you drive out on State Street or happen to go to the Kumba Shopping Center. There's a church there that I used to be a member of, Grace Lutheran Church. That closed, which is kind of a, well, it was quite a, an experience to go through. And it is now, I mean, I, it gave birth to a low income for seniors housing center in conjunction with the city of Santa Barbara's housing program and a nonprofit called Front Porch, so that these will be subsidized homes for seniors in a really nice walkable neighborhood. But do you know that the city permitted the apartment complex that's going up right next to it, and those apartments will start at something between two and three thousand dollars a month. Now that didn't have to happen either, and that's closer to home with people who uh, I don't know if they were required to put some affordable units. I don't. They were. Are they? Are? 15 percent? It could be it. People are, we let builders do this, don't we? And property owners and whatever. And I, I don't know anything about that business, so I don't want to criticize anybody on it, but it behooves us all to be a lot more involved in um, decision making, even right here in our backyard, so to speak.
Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, the, the ADU thing, because it was supposed to be for, they kept talking about we need affordable housing, and then instead they built high-end condos, There's, with, and then they didn't even make it put in any parking. But I just want to talk about the bigger problem, I think, is carpetism. Uh, we don't have free enterprise in our country anymore, or even in the world, we have uh, global corporatism, and that's why they don't pay taxes, and this uh, Reagan started with, well, even before Reagan, the trickle-down theory, which doesn't work, and the more money you give them, they just put it offshore, they don't create jobs. So we really have to rein it in, we, we really have to rein in this corporatism and allow free enterprise, I think they should um, legalize hemp growing, and then we could we could help the environment, it could replace uh, timber cutting down, and we could make uh, we could stop, you know, planting cotton. And we could make fabric out of it. We can make fuel out of it. Uh, like I said, build the materials. Everything you can make out of hydrocarbons, you can make out of carbohydrates, and it would be biodegradable, more affordable, safe, and sustainable. And then we could we could go, you know, like solar and wind and thermal and geothermal and uh, tidal. And there's so many solutions that we could, but. The corporations that there's just unlimited money in our political system, and we really have to to, to say no to that. And even if we have to have a constitutional amendment that says corporations are people, money isn't speech, but people are scared of opening up the constitution. I understand that, but we really have to put a stop to corporatism. Mm. I keep thinking uh, a huge aspect of this is our educational system. What are we teaching? How are we teaching it? And are the right values being taught? Are we preparing our young people to make the changes we've been talking about here? We have an educator in the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, would, I would say from in an educator's perspective, we're definitely trying to instill the good values into our students. Um, we do our best to do that, um, but we only have them for a certain amount of time, and then they go home. And, watch TV. Yeah, and you you can only do so much with them. You kind of have to have the cooperation of the families and the parents, um, and that's where sometimes you see a big difference from you know the kids that really value education and really push through. Um, to the ones that maybe don't value it so much. Um, so the schools can only do so much. The families need to kind of partner up with the, with the schools. I'd like to add that perhaps it's not just the schools that's part of the educational system. What happens after school? What organizations are putting programs together for that? We have children growing into young adults. They have no background as to law or medicine or, or banking or how do you even have the skills to make decisions? When I was in school, my favorite class was humanities. And they don't even teach it anymore that I'm aware of. Well, how many families, how many families sit at a table to eat a meal together? No, no matter what they eat, where they have a conversation with everyone included. I assumed growing up the way I did that um, this was the way everybody did. And um, now I discovered that, uh, and thank goodness there is an opportunity to eat at school because for some, so many of our families, that's the only nutrition they get in the day. And that there, there, there's no ever any kind of, no matter who the family is comprised of, that it's this opportunity to talk with someone else about things that you care about. And that's where most education happens, outside of school, to me. I mean, there's limited amount that you can do during the minutes of a day that's all prescribed with the curriculum that you have to get done. Yeah, and I, I do agree with what you said. It's also having programs and things for the kids after school. I know I volunteered for a little while before I was teaching with like Boys and Girls Club. Um, so having programs like that, and I know there's other ones around town, are a huge, huge benefit. So it's a place where they can have positive role models, where they can have a safe place to be. 
um, where they can be doing positive things. Um, so having more programs like that outside of the schools is just as important, if not more important, a lot of the time. So yeah, I echo that for sure. I've got the mic. I have a question for Dan and Myra. <laughs> Since you got the mic first, uh, Dan and Myra, um, do you know, because you just graduated from UCSB, and I don't know how long you've been out of it, Myra, but uh, in regards to, do you know personally, not with giving names out of, students that are sleeping on couches and not eating enough food a day? Um, university students, yes. Oh, yeah. I know someone who was in my program sleeping in his car because um, he couldn't afford to also pay rent and go to school at the time. Um, so for sure. And I know you know more about the university as a whole, so I'll let you know. So personally, I remember my first year living in an apartment by myself I was able to afford paying rent, but I remember not being able to afford buying food. So if I had one box of oatmeal, that's literally all that I ate for like a week until I got my next paycheck. So I was working about 30 hours at Vons, and this was before the food bank was on campus. So there, and really, the necessity is there, and it's just there's a lot of shame, a lot of um, embarrassment to say, hey, I'm a college student, I'm supposed to be living this fabulous life, um, but there was, yeah, not, not always enough food. Um, so there is a, um, a food pantry now on campus to help our students. And so I still am active with um, some of our undergrads. I used to advise a sorority comprised of mostly um, first year underrepresented college women. And so a lot of these women were also um, kind of living financial um, financial aid paycheck to paycheck or working multiple jobs and um, attending all of the free programming to have access to food um, because that shame and that stigma of going to the food bank was still um, a pretty big one. <coughs> Hi, I just want to piggyback what Mara was saying about the food bank on campus. Um, we did a food drive for the food bank was it a year or two years ago. Two. And um, as I, I was platforming one Sunday and I announced the food drive and what the purpose was for, and a, a member came up and yelled at me because it was preposterous that there were starving students on the campus of UCSB. If they can afford tuition, why couldn't they afford to eat? So we talk about the stereotypes on the other end of the spectrum, and despite, and she, interesting enough, had worked at the university. Mm -hmm. So you would have thought that she had first-hand knowledge and experience of witnessing this, and she was out of it that it didn't exist. So I just wanted to add that shit. Uh, I was just going to make a comment that, uh, you know, when we had the clip about the classism and the separation of wealth and the negative ripple effect that comes from that, um, it, it, it goes right into uh, mental illness, depression, anxiety, alcoholism, drug addiction. People are overwhelmed with the challenge of trying to make the day to day and in their frustration they become angry and bitter and resentful. And, um, so in that shame and guilt and remorse about finding themselves in these situations, even college students are coming out of college with a hundred plus thousand dollar uh, college debts uh, to be greeted with a forty-five, fifty thousand dollar a year salary and then try to pay that back. And so there's a huge burden to overcome right at the very start of their young careers. Um, as the se separation of wealth continues and the gap widens, um, we in the trenches you know, find that there are more and more numbers of people who come uh, to 12-step programs of recovery or homeless shelters or as many people that I've spoken with recently, uh, a couple in particular, have mentioned that, as this gentleman pointed out with his shower, you know, if we can raise the self-esteem and bring the person up by giving them activities that bring them back, 
then they can act their way into better thinking. And um, when the people are uh, stuck in a spot where they are unable to provide themselves with a shelter, but realize that that car is their ticket to a job, then they tend to stay in their cars versus go to a, a you know, I mean, when I, towards the end of my career, I was kind of upset about blowing money on food and rent. So, um, uh, you know, it's a very fine line between those that have and those that have not. And in this community especially, it's extremely difficult to find yourself with shelter, water, food, and all the essentials so that you can live a proud and happy life and be at peace and eat. Um, and, but it's, uh, I think that the activities to bring us up and the compassion and the love from the community is uh, probably the answer, I think, in my experience. Anyway. I'd just like to tag on to that, too. I, uh, I'm a psychiatric nurse at uh, Cottage Hospital. I work on the chemical dependency detox unit and the psychiatric unit. And what I see over and over and over, day after day after day, are people who are, you know, they were talking about the line and, and, and how the bottom fell, fell out. There's so many people that are just barely above the line, they're just barely making it. And what they do, if they don't have good coping skills, if they don't have, if they haven't learned how to do that education, you know, learn that as, as a young person, um, you, start, you start trying to anesthetize yourself. You, 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 it, it's very, very hard to realize that you're about ready to, you know, go below that line. And so there's so much self-anesthetizing um, going on. There's so much drug addiction now. There's, and, and I don't know that there's, I, I think there is more and there's a lot that I don't even see. There's a lot of hidden addiction. A lot of people out there who are, who are medicating their unhappiness, their anxiety. They're medicating that with drugs and alcohol. And uh, we, we've only seen just a small amount of this. And we, if we don't do something, you know, that's, that's going to be the next thing. I, I feel it coming. Um, we're not going to have enough hospital beds to be able to take care of people who are, who are just kind of at, the, at that line, at the edge, and they're going to fall. So whatever we can do to create safety nets and create programs, like you're saying, uh, create something to help people feel better about themselves is where we go. There's some other hands out here. Emiliano has been, your, 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 your shoulder's going to fall off. Let's have, it's working its way over here. Okay, so, so let's have I mean, next, whoever has it next. <laughs> Don't do anything, he'll do it. Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. I just wanted to kind of address like the economic classism thing and to me education a little bit. I just feel like I notice in this country because I've traveled a lot that there's such an emphasis on going to college but getting like an MBA, you know, getting this great degree, you know, that you're going to be a banker or a stockbroker or whatever. And I think that um, trade schools are really overlooked in this country. Because so many kids go to school and they walk out with that fifteen hundred thousand uh, dollar, you know, student loans, and they end up being a carpenter or a waitress or whatever it is. And I think there's too much emphasis on getting, you know, the MBA degree. You can make a lot of money being a plumber, a contractor, you know, all that kind of stuff. And in Europe, like being a waitress or a waiter is not like this kind of depending, I guess, on where you are, super low-class job. They, in Switzerland, they go to school, and it's a hospitality industry, and it's valued. And the stuff that we value is, to me, kind of askew, because everybody needs, you know, somebody to fix their toilet and fix their roof, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But that's so overlooked, I think, when people think about sending their kids to school, it's always this high ambition of this fantastic degree. And I know somebody whose like, nephew just graduated from diesel mechanic school, and that kid's starting out at over $100,000. And that's, you know, that's starting out better than the ones with the MBAs that have $200,000 worth of loans to pay off, you know? So I just think we need to look at our educational system 
in a different direction. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. I'm going to get up here so I can get above the, the line of heads in front of me. Thank you. Um, this is really powerful talk here. I really appreciate this. And this is a time of shadow work right now. The shadow of the United States and what this country has been founded on is in our face right now. And it's forcing us to wake up. You know, I just saw statistics that you know, the Native Americans are 10% more likely to be killed by a police officer than the African Americans in our country. You know, um, there's, uh, when we get into the statistics, it's really hard when we have to look at the numbers, but we're having to face them right now. And I feel that this shadow work, where we're having to face this, is causing an awakening of the people. You're seeing the motive, motivated forces out there unifying, getting together, speaking up like never before. I mean, uh, my mother is Selena and dry, Selena Campbell, and you is you know, yeah, from back in your school days. And the way you stepped up into politics from a relatively unrelated field, but you took a stand and did some beautiful leadership work, and I want to thank you for that. Um, this last year, I've gotten very involved in politics for the first time through Standing Rock uh, activism. Um, and if we don't get involved, it's really hard to feel like we have a right to complain. You know, even this last very polarized city election didn't even touch 50% of, you know, voters coming out. You know, we see all that 80% that's way down here. But if we're just sitting there feeling sorry for ourselves, ain't nothing going to change. They're relying on us feeling disempowered, feeling like we can't do something, and we can't make a difference. Me, a couple of other Jedi activists, we got this city to pull $20 million out of banks that were funding the Dakota Access Pipeline. You know, this was powerful. We didn't have a nonprofit. We didn't have donors. We just really spoke from the heart about, hey, can you live with yourself making these people feed their children oil to drink? And it's been beautiful to see that. And now we have an amazing new mayor. Personally, I feel I'm very excited about the coming four years in the direction that we can go. We have people in positions of, of authority that are listening, I, I found personally. But get involved. You know, there are a lot of issues out there, but pick one that's close to your heart and find other people that have that same issue close to your heart. And get together and start speaking up, start talking with our elected officials, start proposing resolutions that can become ordinances, that can become bills, that can become laws. And then things can change. We have a basis. Um, really quickly also, another thing, I really feel it's important to know your neighbor. You know, there is, there are a lot of people, and we talk about the homeless, but there are a lot of people just on the edge. There are a lot of people who are living with their parents in order to keep things going. And there are a lot of those parents that are barely making their mortgages. Especially here in Santa Barbara, it's hard to keep things going sometimes. And we all have a happy face mask on, but we don't know what's behind that mask of the person next to us. You might be sitting next to somebody who's an electrician, but then you're going to the phone book, or, oh yeah, we don't use phone books anymore, <laughs> um, Google, to find an electrician. <laughs> And you don't know that that might help your neighbor pay their rent that month, feed their kid that month. You know, I propose these kind of things in different environments, and I just even like you know, not being ashamed to share your needs and being proud to share your offerings, so that we have room to be able to exchange services and help our community and be community for each other in that way. Thank you. Thank you.
I, 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 I really, I really love that concept. You know, it's really people helping people, and um, you know, the, the the fact that we don't really, we're we're not connected. We don't know our neighbors. I mean, I go out of my way to meet my neighbors. I, I think that's an important thing. It's kind of the way I grew up. Well, those of us who are older, we didn't know our neighbors. You know, we played in the streets and we did all kinds of stuff, but it's changed. It's very different now, and, and it's important to do that. And just that, you know, that, that small little thing of, oh, you're, you, you're an electrician, oh, you're a plumber, oh, your brother-in-law is a plumber, does he need some work? I've got, you know, I've got this thing happening that I really don't want to get under there. <laughs> I can do it, but I, no, I'd rather not. So, so thank you for that. And we've kind of segued into, kind of naturally into, what can we do? What can we do to make things better? What are some of uh, some ideas are coming up? Uh, connecting with your neighbors, uh, speaking up, joining up with people who are doing good things. What else, what other things can you think of to help to help with poverty, to help with people who are marginalized, who who, who needs who need some help or some recognition or some something? What can we do? We, Hey, my name is David, uh, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, I've been, uh, I'm sleeping in my car. I have a science degree in nursing. I did DUI, and um, you know, I've had to surrender my license. And I've been sleeping across the street, and uh, you know, I, I've not, you know, I've. I've been coming to this church for a couple of years. I've sang in the choir. And, uh, you know, I've really asked for nothing. And, um, you know, at night, I would, there was, there was a, an outlet where I could plug my cell phone. God, I just, I, I was so grateful for that. You know, to be able to plug in my phone. And uh, uh, two weeks ago, of this church um, covered that up. They, they, um, they put a plastic covering over it, you know, and I can no longer, I can no longer uh, charge my phone. And, uh, you know, I know it's not a big deal for many people, but it's a big deal for me. You know, I don't know why my church isn't helping me. Thank you for sharing. I think that's part of coming together to find a solution, to sharing our story. I think that once we can share and have somebody listen and work together, we can figure out how do we support you instead of prescribe a solution. Um, and that's the beauty that I get to do at my work. I get to listen to people and figure out how to support them um, because there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. Everybody is coming um, into homelessness or hunger for different reasons. And we can't fix it all, but we can certainly listen, be empathetic, and try our best to make those connections because if I can't offer the solution, I may know somebody who can sort of lead those steps. And so um, I thank you for sharing, and I thank you all for lending your ear and thinking in my head, okay, how can I make that connection happen? And not out of force because we feel guilty, but out of compassion because we know that we can do something and that we want to lift one another up. Aren't there some churches where, you can, where parking in the, the parking lots at night is allowed. And safe parking, yes. Yeah, safe parking. You can't do it if there's a nursery school. If there's a nursery school on the property, because First Presbyterian Church had two, they had a, a camper and then they had a water home. But they had preschool, and so they don't have oh. So those have been knocked out. But, but there are still some left. Do they have outlets? I don't know if that's an issue. I was thinking the public library, too, and a restaurant. Like uh, Java Station, uh, here up to Washington. 
And I, you know, as far as outlets are concerned, I, I, I think most, most places do have outdoor outlets, and um, this church certainly has more than one outdoor outlet, so I know that. The county is going to be doing something this, hopefully this year, of uh, having all the county parks at night allow maybe four camper, people that are in campers or vans to come in and spend the night there. I live in Summerlin, and we have a park, and um, it's all being redone, and I'm hoping that we do that and let them before. Because they close the park at sunset. This way, people can right. come in at sunset and stay the night, and then leave the next day, they'll probably go to work. Yes. Right? This is a great idea, and I can take care of quite a few people that might have uh, cars, or because we have a public bathroom, so we can use the bathroom. And, yes. So, anyway, I think it's a great idea. Is that oh, sure. all allowed in the county parks? <coughs> what? Is it allowed in the county parks? They're talking about doing it, so I'm hoping they will. I'm hoping they will. That would be the Board of Supervisors to, yeah, lobby, right. to lobby them. Mm -hmm. yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. uh, David, I just wanted to answer um, your comment about the plugs. <laughs> I'm working here at, at Unity with the renovation project. And the covering of those plugs was a gift by the electrician trying to help us uh, keep the rain out or to protect the plug when they upgraded. So I can certainly do something about that. It was not intentional. Some of the small things that I, I actually was thinking about um, somebody was, um, I was having a conversation, um, actually it was with you, Noel, uh, about, you know, there are people who are um, panhandling at different places, at the shopping centers or at the, on the freeway off ramps or other, you know, other, other locations. And some people are comfortable giving to those people, um, giving money, or giving food, or giving whatever. Uh, some people uh, get creative and give gift cards, or give you know McDonald's uh, a McDonald's gift card to them. If you don't want to give cash. Um, and what that kind of started me thinking about is like you know, do something, do something to help. If you're not comfortable giving at you know, out, out your car window at the, you know, at the stoplight, if you're not comfortable with that, then give some money to the food bank. Mm -hmm. They always want your money, or, or take them some groceries. They actually prefer money, from what I have, uh, the talks I have had with them. They prefer cash or, or a donation so they can get the, whatever it is that they need the most of at the time. But if you want, you know, if you're at the supermarket and want to pick up some canned corn or some soup or something, just go for it and drop it off. They would appreciate that. Well, I have a, I received a bag from the postman. Did any of you? Mm -hmm. I think he's picking up tomorrow. Wow. Yeah, just you know, to just do something, or or the food bank out of UCSB that we were the pantry. The pantry. Yeah. So. So there's a whole, there's a lot, there's a lot beyond just handing somebody a, a, a dollar at the stoplight. There's a whole bunch of other things that we can do to uh, to help people and help families. And I think before we even start with giving somebody money is that we give them the respect that we they deserve. I think a smile goes such a long way in and talking to a lot of uh, my clients, my community members, um, what they always prefer is to be seen as a human. And I know that's something that we can all do, is we can all share a smile, we can all share a warm hello. Um, we, it doesn't have to be money, it doesn't have to be food, it can just be that I see you and you matter. So we uh, have yeah, one more comment. Well, I was just going to tap in on what Myra said, because when you are the recipient of respect and compassion and love, then you get hope, and hope seems to be the answer to change. And when we're in this spot where it takes courage to ask for help, I admire that. Um, you know, when problems are unidentified, they can't be solved. 
And so if we identify the problems and then we reach out with respect to try and meet these people's needs in their very basic uh, hygiene, shelter, uh, access to power for charging devices that give them the ability to search for work. Yeah. Um, you know, fuel for them to go job hunting, um, things that can really help bring them up so that they can turn into a force for the good and reach out and help someone else behind them and then you, you get the positive ripple effect instead of the negative. So um, we're getting really close to the end. Um, if you want to advance to the next slide, Jim. Um, some of the things that we can do that we have identified is to volunteer, find some place to volunteer. For example, uh, a couple hours at the food bank, they would love that. Some um, at transi we, Transition House is one of the places that here uh, we, we support them and, and show up and, and, uh, and provide a meal. Um, so find volunteer opportunities. Go out looking for ways to help. Get educated about what's going on. Make sure you know what the issues are. Talk to Emiliano, he knows everything. Um, <laughs> check in with this new project, the Lo Lois and uh, Walter Capps project. Find out what they're doing. I'm sure that they could use some help. And um, just get educated about what's going on. Learn the language about what, what it is that we're talking about. Make sure that you're on the same page as where we're at. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff being thrown around, a lot of languaging being thrown around that isn't accurate. Learn what's accurate, learn, learn what's really happening. Know your local government, get involved in your local government. It all starts here, in Goleta, in Santa Barbara, in Santa Barbara County, wherever, in Santa Maria, in Lompoc. Uh, get involved with your local government, know what's going on, plug in. Join an organization, demonstrate. Emiliano has something cooking, and it has to do with something I saw on Facebook, and I'm not, I can't speak to it, but you can, can go up to him and find out what he's doing, because I think there's some kind of uh, interesting thing happening there to demonstrate your support for. Um, don't be a silent partner. Don't ignore what's happening. It's, it, don't turn off. Don't, don't uh, get on your computer or on your phone and, and ignore what's happening over here and to your neighbor. Don't be a silent partner. Speak up. Go outside your comfort zone. That's, that's really key because for a lot of us it's uncomfortable. We're in strange territory. Especially for a white privileged guy like me it's uncomfortable sometimes to be in a, in a situation where my privilege is showing. <laughs> it's true, it, it, it makes me feel uncomfortable and I, you know, I kind of want to hide that. And, and sometimes I think people stay away because they feel guilty, right? So go outside your comfort zone. <coughs> make some new friends, make, make some new um, connections. And last but not least, love and be kind to others. That's, that is the most important thing that we can possibly do. It kind of goes along with what you said, Matt Myra, you know, to be respectful and loving and compassionate in the world. So we are exactly right on time. I am so appreciative of this panel. You guys have been amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Have our our um, our uh, what do you call those stickers? Um, they're not stickers. They are things that stick on things. <laughs> Celebrate diversity. They're on sale for two dollars. Um, I have one on my car. You might want to put one on your car. So thank you very much for coming tonight. We'll see you in January.